All right. Hey, guys. Um, so as I look through the attendees list, I recognize a lot of names, which is pretty awesome. But um, so for those of you who don't know us, we've got the free dive shop, the Oregon Free Diving Company here in Oregon City um, and <laughs> train instructors and divers um, all over the place. And with that, really play in the ocean a lot. We both have an interest in uh, science and marine biology. I'm actually, I'm teaching a high school marine biology class right now and Talia has actually worked in that back in South Africa. But these guys, we became aware of this project um, last year and we're excited about what they were doing and wanted more information and um, excited to be able to try and help share information and get people involved. Yeah, I think, I mean, just from outside, it's, you know, as, as being part of the predominantly spearfishing and freediving community, it is important, you know, we want our environments, I suppose the link as to why we're all here and why, you're, why you guys are all here is that the link is that we all enjoy being out there, being in the water, seeing the underwater world for what it is and sustainably harvesting um, where we do. But, you know, that if you, all of us have been in the water and looked around and said, you know, this is not going to be here for much longer at this rate. And we decided to, you know, make, add this to our, I wouldn't say repertoire, but add this to our facility so that we can, you know, also give back um, with what that we've been given uh, with our spearfishing and freediving. Thanks, guys. I will... Uh... Share, start sharing the screen here and I'm going to start with a presentation um, that is basically from the Alok Alliance. I'm John Goodell and I'm the, curi or the uh, Director of Outreach and Community Engagement with the Alok Alliance. So I'm going to start with a little discussion about our work and the, really the tie-in to uh, the broader goal of kelp conservation. If my computer will start sharing. Is, can you guys see that first slide? Yeah. Great. Okay, well, I'm sorry, one second. There's gonna be a little delay here to get, <laughs> get through the first slide. The computer sometimes freezes up with Zoom. And John, since you're uh, waiting on your computer, I'll just pipe in and introduce myself. Tom Calvin, he's here. I'm the coordinator of the Oregon Kelp Alliance. And uh, right now I'm coming to you from the Port Orchard Field Station where I work as the station manager for Oregon State University. And I'll talk after John about what the Kelp Alliance is up to and how you guys can help out. So yeah, normally we, you know, when we, when we the Lock Alliance, when we're talking about the work that, that we're trying to do, it's a very, the subject of sea otters is sort of the ultimate multidisciplinary topic because it's history, prehistory, it's ecology, it's uh, sustainability and, and, and uh, fisheries management and on and on. So I'm not going to go down every, every rabbit hole for this purposes of this talk, but I did want to start off just orienting you a little bit about the Alok Alliance. The Alok Alliance was founded by a, a leader in the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians on the coast of Oregon by the name of Dave Hatch, who was a formal, uh, former member of the, the Tribal Council and took a just a personal interest in sea otters. Um, he was on the, he got to know some archeologists in Oregon and as a result of that, became aware of a atlatl uh, spear. And if you know what an atlatl is, it's a it's a throwing stick in a, in a sort of long arrow that's really more like a spear with fletching on it. And, and he, this atlatl throwing stick was was found in a in an archeological dig on the Oregon's North Coast. And it was made out of a the femur of a sea otter bone. And so that really prompted his interest and passion about sea otters and, and to work towards returning them to Oregon. And so he founded it, he passed away, um, and unfortunately, a, f a few years ago, but it was formally reorganized in 2018 under the leadership of our president, uh, the board president, Bob Bailey. And the mission of the Alok Alliance is to restore a healthy population of sea otters to the Oregon coast, and in the process, help make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. So really the long game for the Alok Alliance is, is that nearshore ecosystem, especially the kelp ecosystem in Oregon. Here's some of the board of directors. Currently, we have uh, David's son, Peter Hatch, 
is on the board and we have three other leaders from the Doc Slider from the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Swiss Law Indians, Robert Kenta, who's tribal council on the tribal council of the Confederated Tribes of Sletz, and uh, Don Ivey, who's the chief of the Coquel tribe, and a number of other conservationists like David Shepherdson, who has recently retired from the Oregon Zoo as their conservation director, and, uh, and, and as I mentioned, Bob Bailey and many others. So it's a pretty, pretty good, pretty good board. The main, our main tasks going forward are to, we're trying to assess the scientific and economic feasibility of the sea otter restoration. And we're trying to help build consensus on, on restoration within the Oregon, you know, public citizens of Oregon stakeholders. And if these things look possible and, and are warranted through a pot process of evaluation and, and public comment, and the whole nine yards, that we would proceed or, or help support a, a plan, a restoration in carefully chosen places on the Oregon coast. So if you want to find out more about us, check out our website at lockalliance.org. And, and you can sign up to receive the, our newsletter and donate. Also check out our podcast. If you go to our archive, our podcast archive on our website, there's nine podcasts that are um, about the, the theme of the podcast series is, is the, uh, the, the kelp ecosystem in the Pacific Northwest. So the topics not only talk about sea otters, but urchin management, um, kelp and, and prehistory archaeology with respect to the kelp ecosystem and, and you know, indigenous people and, and more. So it's a pretty cool series. And then here are some of our social media links. We're on uh, Facebook, you know, and, and Twitter and Instagram. So what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to just help frame the issue here. A lot of you that are listening to this or, or if you're divers, free divers, you're, you're pretty familiar with the issue or at least certainly more so than, than most people in Oregon. But so I'll try not to repeat things you already know, but I'm just gonna talk, frame the issue from kind of an ecological point of view and why sea otters are important or be an important piece of this puzzle that might uh, benefit the kelp ecosystem in Oregon. And then we're gonna shift to sort of the plan. And, and you know, really I would frame this as the long game is really our plan to restore sea otters to the Oregon coast. But there's also the short term, or the near-term plan, which is how are we going to preserve and conserve the kelp that we've got in the next 10 years? For Because sea otter restoration is a long-term thing. It's going to take multiple years to, to even begin. So, in the, and, and as Tom mentioned, some of the, we're going to propose some of the ways that you could help, help, help this process happen. So, I wanted to start out with a pretty simplistic sam uh, example or or analogy in, in, with respect to predators in an ecosystem. And these are the grizzly bear and the, and the wolf in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And, and, you know, biodiversity is a term that's sort of thrown around, but in effect, biodiversity, one of the really take home messages of why biodiversity is important is it's about redundancy. So having multiple components in the ecosystem helps buffer the natural fluctuations that any one species has or the unnatural or artificial fluctuations they might have due to the hand of man, um, you know, redundancy is good. And so in the case of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the pressure that top predators put on elk uh, in that ecosystem helped maintain vibrant stands of cottonwood and aspen and willow habitat in the, in the greater Yellowstone region. So that's just a terrestrial example. Um, in, you know, our ecosystem on the, on the Oregon coast, uh, we have really the two predators that are most applicable or important here are, of course, sea otters and the Pycnopodia, the sunflower sea star. And their top-down effects or the benefits to, to, the, to the ecosystem, of course, as many of you know, is sea otters benefit kelp. Um, the Pycnopodia sunflower sea star also benefits kelp habitat by, by consuming urchins, just like sea otters do. And sea otters also have a, a good, a strong positive uh, effect on eelgrass or seagrass in estuaries. But, you know, we've seen some shifts. And so, as many of you know, uh, the first real big shift to this ecosystem or influence from man was the, the historical fur trade. And so, before, you know, th there was settlements in much of the Pacific region and the inland, the inland Pacific, uh, there was early fur, fur hunting going on and the Russians and English and some Americans that were uh, mariners that were coming into this region and hunting and trading for sea otter pelts. 
And this started as early as 1760, 1770, 1780. And by, 17, by 1840 or 1850, most of the removals had happened. So this was a very early uh, part of the history of wildlife um, exploitation in the North American content or continent. And so in this case, this is a, a text or a, an excerpt from a newspaper in Oregon where it talks about someone shooting one of the last sea otters in the Oregon coast for you know, a pelt that valued at about $500, which at the time was enough for someone to buy a house with, with acreage. You know, so it, they were sort of like the the rhino of the of its era. They, it was an incredibly valuable pelt. It, it was the most valuable pelt in the world. So after this, uh, you know, era of of heavy exploitation by by the late eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds, there was just these remnant populations. So you had uh, one tiny population on the Big Sur uh, area, and then you had some isolated populations in Prince William Sound and then on some, some, not all of the Aleutian Islands. And then, you know, during the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, there was some restoration and translocation efforts and they expanded and were able to expand the Big Sur population to a certain degree, although there's some problems due to great white sharks, um, really what appears to be curtailing dispersal, natural dispersal north and south. So that's sort of a limiting factor there. But there's an 800 mile gap between the that central California population and the next closest population, which is the translocated and partially restored sea otter population in um, the northern Washington state and southern BC. And then there's a little bit of a gap, but then you get up into southeast Alaska and there's a very robust restored population in Southeast Alaska. And then the, the Aleutian Islands are, are better than they were, but but still declining in some in some regions for, for other reasons. So now we get to this, you know, modern era where although sea otters were missing in places like the Oregon coast, there was the, the Sunflower Sea Star was in some ways operating as kind of a redundancy in the system. And, and it was an important urchin predator. But as you know, there was a, this continental scale sea star wasting disease that affected many species of sea stars, but particularly the Pycnopodia sunflower sea star that we're talking about, this urchin predator collapsed. And it was actually recently the uh, International Union of um, the, now I forget the anecdote, but, or the, uh, the name of it, but it, the conservation, uh, the organization that that helps guide the conservation status of, of wildlife species around the, the world, they did a pretty intensive review and uh, looked at over 60,000 population surveys and they, they recorded or did it through this analysis documented an over 90% decline in the Pycnopodia population and they haven't really seen a meaningful recovery. So as wildlife, you know, urgent wildlife priorities go, this is sort of at the top of the list. This is as bad as it gets. I mean, this would sort of be like if cougars vanished from the Western, the Western North American range. It's at that scale. So now we have these two missing pieces, these two missing predators. And as many of you know, the combination of that and the, the sort of increase in, pur in purple urchin uh, barrens combined with ocean warming trends. And of course, ocean warming trends are, you know, affecting kelp growth. And uh, we think they're affecting other invertebrates and could possibly be even connected to the wasting disease itself, the sea star wasting disease itself. So we're seeing a dramatic shift in the ecosystem. And I think a lot of people are becoming more and more aware of this and more concerned and more interested in, in conservation action. Here's a picture that many of you have probably seen or, or seen similar versions of this, uh, a sort of before and after of a, a kelp area and then after, you know, an urchin barren. And, you know, the, there's the problem with this issue, which is so different than many other, what you'd call prey populations that are studied by scientists is that most prey because of their the diseases inherent in any population and, and lifespans and requirements for food. Most species like say rabbits, if they get to be too abundant or white-tailed deer or what have you, they uh, will, disease will increase, 
Starvation will increase due to the lack of food because they've eaten themselves out of house and home. And so even without a predator um, influencing the population, most prey populations that have, a, have the ability to reproduce at such massive scales will collapse. And what's so unique about the urchin is that they can go into a sort of dormancy period and they could sustain themselves in this dormant state on the ocean floor in these urchin barren conditions for almost for decades almost. So it becomes a stable state, an alternative stable state. And that's that's sort of that unique facet of urchin uh, life, life history is really at the core of this issue. And as many of you know, you know, the loss of these kelp ecosystems is significant because they provide such important habitat. And I won't, you know, go into this in too much detail because a lot of you know this, but it's uh, it's a key habitat for fisheries and and uh, it's, you know, captures the sun's energy and, and, and things that you're very well familiar with. The two species we're talking about here, of course, are the bull kelp and the giant kelp, which is really a small uh, isolated patches of that in Southern Oregon. So how do we reverse this, uh, you know, alternative stable state and and really return uh, more of these historical kelp uh, forests back into their you know vibrant kelp condition? And so that's the question that we're trying to solve. And uh, the first really most well recorded or well studied, you know part of this question or, or, or solution to this question is sea otters. And sea otters are known as a keystone species. And, and that term really relates to their disproportionate influence on the ecosystem. So sort of like beavers have this incredibly disproportionate influence on, on riparian habitat, uh, sea otters have this incredibly disproportionate influence on the kelp ecosystem. They essentially, um, almost they're a, a ecosystem architect or a habitat architect. They, they build kelp habitat in, in some ways by their influence, their tro the trophic cascade that they put into, into effect with respect to urchins and other herbivores, other kelp herbivores. And so not only is this known, but it's probably one of the most robust uh, canons of, of ecological literature that's out there. It, and uh, it really began with Jim Estes' work in the early 70s. And Jim, for his master's degree, got an opportunity to go out to the Aleutian Islands to try to come up with a master's project. And uh, it was one of those great episodes of great timing and, and good luck, like a lot of, you know, breakthrough research. Um, what he noticed immediately was that on Amchitka Island, there was these incredible uh, kelp forests with a lot of fish and um, beautiful scenes when he got underwater. And this is where otters were present, were in Amchitka. And so he noticed these vibrant kelp forests in the presence of otters. And then when he went to Shemya, he, there were no sea otters there and uh, there was mostly urchin barrens. And so that was a, 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 an observation that underpinned his research and he wanted to, to look into that and he, he did he wrote several papers that were sort of foundational in the field of ecology, but then it just kept going. Research, he kept studying this. Other colleagues of his kept studying this, not just in the Aleutian Islands, but in Southeast Alaska, in British Columbia, in Washington, and in California. And so this research and the same sort of conclusion has been repeated over and over and over again. So, you know, the public sees on the surface when they're looking at kelp habitat, they see sometimes at low tide, you might see the, the bulbs and, and, you know, the kelp laying over here at the low tide. And if you're lucky, you'll see a sea otter. But what a lot of you guys see is the incredible diversity that kelp supports below the surface. Um, of course, rockfish, there's over 15 species of rockfish on the Oregon uh, Department, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's uh, strategy um, they list strategy species, and there's just dozens of, of rockfish that are on that list, and they all depend on kelp habitat at, at, one, at one phase of their life history or another. Similarly, salmonids like salmon species and even whales like gray whales use kelp. But there's some not so obvious benefits like carbon storage, and what we used to think is that, well, sure, kelp uh, uses, you know, collects carbon from the water. Um, and can store carbon, but it, uh, it it decays and just releases the carbon back to the water. So it's, it has no net positive effect. But what scientists are beginning to understand is that 
uh, this drift or detritus kelp is actually going into deeper water and being deposited in these very deep sections that are not necessarily coming back into that ecosystem and being released back into the into the system. So there's an understanding that kelp has this net positive benefit with respect to carbon storage. But it benefits, kelp also benefits seabirds. Um, you know, there's a lot more of the, uh, the, the seabird species that hunt for hunt fish, for example, are do much better when there's vibrant kelp um, supporting these larval uh, fish populations. And uh, it benefits shorebirds because when kelp drifts up on the beach, these kelp racks, uh, it'll, there'll be a lot of insects around that. A lot of shorebirds will be drawn to that. And, and in turn, uh, birds like peregrine falcons will be attracted to the beach and, and hunt those shorebirds. But it's not just kelp. And so what's interesting about the uh, the trophic cascade of sea otters in estuaries is their benefit to eelgrass. And so, as you may know, there's these small sea slugs or snails that are eelgrass or seal, seagrass grazers. And so they remove the algae that grows on the blades of, of this grass and uh, help keep it healthy. It allows the grass to photosynthesize better and essentially a stand of eelgrass or a bed of eelgrass will, will be in much better shape if there's a good population of these grazers that are grazing the algae, not the grass itself. So without sea otters, small crabs like the the the, uh, um, the exotic green crab, which is you know moving into many estuaries on the Pacific, um, they will eat a lot of these small sea grazers and sort of reduce their population to the effect that it actually hurts the eelgrass itself. And so when you return sea otters into the system, they hammer on those crabs, and it really benefits. Uh, the eelgrass itself, cleaning of the algae, and uh, there's a much increased function and, and, uh, and in some cases just increased surface area or acreage of eelgrass. So, you know, getting back to, re to reintroduction, we know that or we expect that returning sea otters to Oregon coast will have some direct benefits in, in the sense of it'll restore a historical connection between Oregon's coastal tribes and this iconic species. It'll improve habitat for commercial and recreational fish species. So there's no question, as you all know, that kelp benefits the fin fish uh, po you know, populations. And it'll help benefit, you know, it'll, it'll increase ecosystem resilience in the nearshore environment in Oregon. And probably be a, you know, the sea otter, sea otter presence will probably be a, a, an economic boon to tourism and wildlife viewing on the coast. So. These are some benefits. There are some possible conflicts that we expect with, you know, competition with commercial and recreational harvest of Dungeness crabs and, and um, urchins, clam diggers, and there's going to be some localized conflicts. And so we're trying to trying to address that. But one thing to keep in mind is that compared to south th uh, southeast Alaska. Um, if you look at Southeast Alaska here on the left, it's a very, it's sort of the ideal sea otter habitat. All these protected bays and estuaries and uh, inlets and islands really create a sort of sea otter habitat in every direction, so to speak. So the carrying capacity of this region of Southeast Alaska is many, many times over what the Oregon coast would be because the Oregon coast is mostly, is a very straight geomorphology, sort of north-south. There's actually very few inlets and in, in estuaries in Oregon relative to the to the length of the coastline. And there's certainly good rocky habitat for, for otters, but it's punctuated by these sandy subtidal stretches. So, you know, otters are certainly can have been in Oregon and they can be in Oregon, Oregon again, but their populations are not going to be anything like Southeast Alaska. And, and as a result, their competition with the fish, commercial and recreational fisheries probably won't won't be anything like the examples we're seeing in Southeast Alaska. But, you know, this is going to take time. And even on best case scenario, our efforts are going to take, it's going to take about five years or four years until we have, if all goes well and our feasibility studies go well, um, if we were, to, if we actually get the green light to do this, it probably won't be you know, sooner than four years from now, or three to four, three to five years until otters potentially are in the water in Oregon. And so this is going to take a lot of cooperative effort among many groups in Oregon. It's going to require public support and funding. And uh, so it's it's a process. 
And so really what we're talking to you guys about is this big picture of the kelp conservation strategy. And that's really starting with what Tom's going to talk to you about now, which is sort of this near-term effort of like, hey, we've got to do something right now. The sea otter thing is going to is a good idea, but it's going to take some time. And so th this diagram doesn't necessarily, these dates don't necessarily reflect what will actually happen. But just to give you some relative idea of what we're talking about is to try to do something in the near term while the sea otter translocation effort is underway. And really what we're hoping is that if we can get otters in the water, say by 2024, that the really significant ecological benefits of their presence to the kelp ecosystem probably won't be readily observed until a few years after that. I mean, some benefits to sea otters occur within one year locally, but when we're talking about bigger areas, I think it's gonna take a little bit long with that, longer than that. So this kind of helps, I hope, contextualize what we're trying to talk about. But there may also be the possibility that, you know, if sea otters don't even get translocated to the northern Oregon coast, and there's little spots of kelp that you, that we all know are, are, are highly valued by you and are these little oases on the Oregon coast that you care about, you know, it may be that some of the work that Tom's going to talk about is relevant even well into the sea otter reintroduction and beyond. So anyway, um, you know, and finally, you know, I wanted to mention this sort of involvement of, of the diving community and why it's important. It's like you guys are the people that really have a bond with this resource and particularly in these 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 kelp, these magical kelp areas. Um, in the case of the peregrine falcon and, and its recovery, it was the falconry community that noticed the decline. And they were the ones that started to captive breed peregrines, and they were the ones that formed the Peregrine Fund, which was the main impetus behind the recovery. And it was that personal connection with the resource that really, they were the energy behind the whole thing. And, you know, as you may know, the Peregrine is one of the only real delisting success stories where a species was listed on the Endangered Species Act and delisted. So it's, a, I think, a corollary to what we're talking about here is this is this underwater world that you're all a part of. And, and I think that, you know, you guys are really poised to be a major part of this, this conservation effort, I guess. So with that, I will hand it over to Tom. Cool. Thanks, John. That was a really good sort of segue and I like your your diagram there showing sort of the timeline. I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna to try to share my screen now. You should be able to share on top of this. Right. I'm going to continue saying I can, so I'm going to. And can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I put this together pretty quickly and my computer is already acting out on me, so sorry about that. Uh, so as John just said, um, uh, I guess I'll reintroduce myself, Tom Calvinese. I'm right now coordinating the Oregon Kelp Alliance. I work for Oregon State University and manage the Port Orchid Field Station. And what I'm going to talk about here is just a little intro about the Oregon Kelp Alliance, why, we, why it exists, why it came about and uh, so a little bit about what we've done so far and what we're hoping to do and how I hope you all who are interested can help out and how we can sort of build connections up and down the coast around this initiative. Uh, so you can find out more at OregonKelp.com. There's the big address there. And I'll add, so I have some contact information at the end that I'll share with you as well. And like uh, everybody else right now, we're on social media. You can go to Oregon Kelp. At, on Twitter and Instagram and working on launching a Facebook page as well because I know there's a lot of uh, diver communities on Facebook. <clears throat> the photos in this slide are all taken from here in Port Orford. The first one is a little stand of kelp down by Humbug. The second one is an intern that I took out to Redfish Rocks to do some free diving uh, for his internship. And the third one is a little patch of urchin barren at Orford Heads in the area where we've started to do some pilot work. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm not going to read through this whole list, but just so you have a sense of sort of the breadth of the alliance, 
from scientists to commercial divers, sport divers, uh, science, uh, researchers, ecotour operators, uh, agencies, ODFW's shellfish program, uh, notably also uh, DLCD, Department of Land Conservation Development, the uh, Oregon, uh, sorry, the Oregon, uh, sorry, Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Coordinating Council, obviously the Alaka Alliance uh, and others, as well as some members of coastal tribes. And uh, that was intentional because we are, what we're trying to do is build an alliance that's really bringing people together from multiple perspectives to share what we, what we know and what we're trying to do and uh, receive some funding from Oregon Sea Grant, Oregon Wildlife Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust. A uh, little bit about me. Um, I started out here in, sorry, in Port Orford, uh, doing my master's degree in fisheries science at OSU out at, or at uh, Redfish Rock, studying rockfish, tracking their movement patterns there with some acoustic technology. But at the same time, was working as an urchin diver. That's me with some bunch of bags of urchins that we harvested out at Orford Reef when it was uh, being productive. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, most of my dive experience here was uh, working commercially and paying a lot of attention to urchins and kelp in places where they live and uh, where they're abundant and where they're not so abundant. Uh, this is just a slide showing uh, aerial kelp surveys that were conducted by ODFW in this region between 1990 and 2011. Uh, if we did those surveys today, uh, those brownish blotches, and, and just to orient you, the darker the color, the more often they cited kelp during the surveys. But if they did that survey today, uh, it would be uh, markedly reduced from what you're seeing here. And one of the things we're working on is to, uh, re to reinitiate those aerial kelp surveys along the Oregon coast so that we can get an update on this, this, uh, these data. There have been some uh, satellite uh, analyses. <clears throat> those are great but sometimes they, they miss some of the very near shore kelp beds. They really work well on these large scale kelp beds. And as things are reducing, we're, of course, we're gonna have to look more closely to get a clearer picture. And one of the things we're thinking about is working on uh, doing that with drones as well. Um, these are some, uh, a couple of uh, graphs that ODFW produced. Uh, showing their urchin surveys at Orford Reef on the upper graph between 1984 and last two, uh, 2019. And then at Redfish Rocks from 2010 to 2019. And as you can see in both areas, uh, they are seeing a, a very big increase in density as in number of urchins per square meter. At both at Orford Heads and at Redfish Rocks. Not as high at Redfish Rocks as at Orford Heads, but that Orford Heads, um, sur the last survey at Orford Heads really kind of caught everybody's attention, got a lot of, uh, a lot of press. You probably heard about it. And um, that was kind of on, on the tail of some conversation with some of my urchin diving colleagues who honestly, um, a couple of years back, realized that it was no longer, uh, I guess, no longer marketable to work Orford Heads because of the reduction in kelp and the explosion of purple sea urchins and the, re and the subsequent reduction in value of those urchins. So um, I guess I should say, uh, if I didn't already say this, that the Oregon Kelp Alliance really uh, was initiated by urchin divers who were spending a lot of time, as John was saying earlier, you know, divers are the ones who are always down there looking around and noticing changes. And really was, they, they were the ones who brought it to my attention just in conversations we were having on ad hoc, uh, just checking in now and then. And then in my own sort of observations, just diving around here, even after I sold my permit, I kept diving. So I think that all just, <clears throat> points out that you know divers are the ones who know uh, before anybody and did kind of push the button and 
caused us all to come together and start figuring out what we're going to do about this. Uh, so one of the things we're proposing right now is, is to establish a restoration area at Orford Heads. Uh, we're in, this, pro, this proposal is in development right now, and we intend to pursue this this year and get this designation put in place, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. But in the meantime, uh, a bunch of us came together in October of last year to do a bunch of uh, monitoring dives, some scientific diving, and some sport diving and photo, photo taking. And what you're seeing here is a couple of scientific divers getting ready to do some surveys off the Black Pearl, which is a eco-tour vessel operated by Dave Lacey at South Coast Tours, who's one of the members of Oregon Kelp Alliance. Upper right is a, uh, one of the divers uh, that was just uh, in the shot for photos. In the lower right is what it looked like about four years ago when there were actually kelp beds there in Nellie's Cove where the kayak tour operators go. So uh, this is a map of the area that we, we chose to initiate this pilot. And what you're seeing are the red lines are the monitoring dives that were done by Reef Check as part of uh, designating a new monitoring site for their program. So that'll continue this year. We're also planning to do some training at, uh, to monitor this site and then add sites up and down the coast. <clears throat> the, uh, the other pins that were there that are there with the S on them are the places where we did uh, scientific dives as part of a ongoing research being done out of OIMB by Aaron Galloway and Sarah Hamilton and intending to do additional work there as part of a newly funded Sea Grant uh, project that will be looking at this, uh, at the kelp forest ecology and specifically at some of the things we've been talking about around urchins and kelp. Another site that we're <clears throat> proposing to look to do work in is down in Brookings. And it's just a map that was put together by a diver there who's hoping to uh, sort of lead that, that group down in Brookings. And these are a couple of shots that we took uh, when we did some exploratory diving at South Cove in Cape Arago. On the left, uh, I thought this was really interesting because these two photos were taken like really close to each other. So here you can see there's this really thick kelp bed on the left. And if you just swim inshore from that a few kicks and go down, I did this on a free dive. You go down and this is what you're seeing on the right, which looks very much like an urchin barren. But if you pull some of those urchins up and crack them, you actually can find some fairly good looking uni. And what we think that's telling us is that we've got this overpopulation or surplus production of urchin, but there's still enough kelp around for them to sort of have a healthy metabolism and produce gonad. But how long, for how long? And I think this is sort of the, the big question right now is that we're seeing these patches and one of the divers on, on this survey <clears throat> said that he had seen it, he had been there uh, a year before and what he was seeing was that the urchin patches had increased about uh, doubled in size. So that's anecdotal. Obviously we want to uh, refine those estimates more and actually attach numbers to them because those numbers talk to managers and people that make rules about things. And so we want to be able to uh, back up our story with uh, data. So uh, where we are right now is um, we're putting together a scientific take permit. As many of you probably know, the recreational take limits that ODFW has set for uh, the other category, which is where urchins sit, I'll only, only allow a take of like 10 urchins a day per person. And obviously that's inadequate to address some of the some of the challenges that we're facing. So what we have realized is that we can uh, we can develop a scientific take permit, and that's what we're doing, that will incorporate in it rules that will allow us to take the an adequate amount of urchins to reduce the density down to a level that we're hoping to achieve to promote kelp restoration or kelp recovery. And so I'm hoping to submit that permit this month. And in the, within that permit, 
the goal is to identify at least four sites, the three I just showed you, and then of course, one that I've talked a little bit with Talia and Dan about and, and Lee and a few other folks from up there, up around Cape Lookout, and possibly, possibly Pacific City. And so the, the essential structure would be to identify some lead organizers at each site that we can include in the permit that can, uh, and, and others who we can put on, put on the permit, then we'll be permitted to do this. And then hopefully make it so that we can organize other divers who can participate as well. All of this is going to get, it's going to play out in the permitting process that's now uh, getting underway. But the goal is uh, probably an ambitious one, but I think we're going to push for it anyway, get that permit approved next month so that we can get the green light to get started this spring. Uh, so that's sort of like the, the basic outline of what I was here to talk about, but what I really want to do now is sort of shift gears, take questions and recruit <laughs> because it's going to take a lot of people and hands and minds and working together to actually ex uh, establish and maintain these oases that John is referring to, which is what we're hoping to do. So that's a rough outline. There's a lot of details underneath that, and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, here's some information I'll leave up there for a minute uh, about the Oregon Kelp Alliance. Uh, that's our sort of logo. You can look for that. We'll be seeing more of that. We're also working with a group called Wild Human. They were here in October and before and since to capture some of the story of the people that are doing this uh, in image and words. And they'll be rolling that out. We're working together to roll that out in the coming weeks. So you can be on the lookout for stuff about what the Oregon Kelp Alliance is up to on the social media channels. You can go to the website, sign up to our mailing list. You'll, be, you'll get things that way. Uh, you can email me directly. My email's on the screen. And you can also call me. That's my mobile phone for work. And feel free to call me on that number. Um, always happy to talk about this. I'm super stoked about it and been hammering away at it for a couple of years and I'm really excited to get things going. Um, so I'll stop there and turn it back over to John and maybe you you can. Um, yeah, if I've got a question. So. Yeah, I've got one question from Kurt. Kurt, are you ready? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thanks for this presentation. It's super, super energizing for anyone who's stared at all these urchins and wondered what we could do. So thank you for that. Um, second, I, I raised my hand for as active a role as you need in either of the two Northern sites, um, Pacific City or Cape Lookout. And third, I had a question for Tom. Um, will that permit that we're applying for include culling or just take of urchins? Good question. I didn't uh, I didn't make it clear. I skipped over a lot of little details along the way, but you know, if you push the button, the monkey will talk as long as you want him to. <laughs> uh, so you asked. So, uh, so the short answer is the intent. My intention is to get a, get a get a permit approved that will allow both for take, surfacing, and culling in place, um, and a couple of reasons why. Uh, one of the side projects I didn't talk about that the Oregon Kelp Alliance is involved in is working with a group called Oregon Sea Farms, which is actually a business that grew out of the Oregon, I'm sorry, the uh, urchin diving company, Mach, Mach 1 Industries. Um, it's basically a family operation, but they started uh, cultivating dulse on the dock in Port Orford and just recently got a small grant uh, with some support from Alaka. Thank you for that. Uh, from Oregon Wildlife Foundation, and we're piloting a urchin cultivation project using dulse to fatten up skinny urchins and get them to marketable quality so they can go into the market. So we imagine a subset of commercial harvest, essentially you could think about it as sort of cherry picking the big fat, the biggest urchins to be fattened up and then we, that we get more money. The urchin fishery has historically been in red urchin, mostly because of size. You just get more bang for your buck if you're picking reds because the uni is bigger and so you get more money for them. But the intention is to develop a market for purple, purple, uh, purple urchin uni 
that we cultivate by feeding it adults. Uh, but we also know it's going to be a lot of work and probably not realistic to try to surface all the urchins. We're developing some markets in things like compost, um, looking for other, uh, other, other uh, markets for surfaced urchins that aren't valuable in terms of their uni. But even after all that is said and done, we think it's, gonna, it, it's not realistic and we're gonna need to get permission to do some in, in place culling. Um, one of the challenges to that is ODFW has a no waste policy. So they're reluctant to permit people to, uh, like, I don't know if you know this, but it's actually not permitted to go catch a fish and then just like throw it on the ground and not eat it. So they have a, a general policy to not waste, which, you know, I, I get that, that makes sense to me. But we, we're probably gonna to need to do a little bit of negotiating in the permitting to allow us to do some in-place culling. And we're interested in um, also bringing in like some uh, develop, dissolved oxygen sensors so we can resolve issues that might come up about the effect on the ecosystem of the releasing of all the urchin guts if you were to go in do a lot of crushing and culling. So stay tuned, that's the goal. Um, and there's a lot of in, uh, imaginative and innovative people out there developing ways to crush a lot of urchins in a short period, like maces and things like that. We've got a question from Matt. Um, do you want, are you ready, Matt? And uh, can you hear me? Uh, yep. Yeah. So I think my question's been answered. I'm actually one of the administrators of the uh, of the Washington Free Divers, so I'm kind of just uh, looking in, really excited about what you're doing. Uh, and I and I think you've already answered my question mostly because I was wondering what the treatment was in the in the areas that you're going to be um, examining. But uh, I, it, it kind of brings up another question that I've seen come up, uh, and it's perhaps just a curiosity. But when you're culling Someone has expressed concern that the culling might be spreading gametes. Uh, could you explain what that concern is? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to lead with a caveat that it's, uh, I'm a primarily a fish biologist, so the urchin, urchin biology is not my forte, but I will tell you what I know. And I'm an economics, uh, I'm an economics professor, so I really don't know anything either. Oh, cool! Then I then I can fully answer your question. Um, <laughs> you, you, I you think the um, risk. I think there's sort of two parts to this. One is that if we are looking at um, urchin barrens that are that have really developed pretty fully, where urchins have more or less munched away everything, and they're gnawing on rocks, and they basically starve themselves. Um, urchins, urchins in that condition uh, are not producing gametes. Okay. They are essentially starving and they're not, they're not making it with each other, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, but if you were in an area where you had urchins that were uh, viable uh, in terms of reproduction, I think it would it would make sense and will make sense and we should pay attention to if uh, looking at this in terms of seasonality, what time of year, uh, do what we do when we pick urchins, test them, uh, subsample them, see you know what, what are we looking at here? Are we dealing with a bunch of urchins that are just about to spawn? And if so, uh, should we be crushing a bunch of urchin spawn and spreading it around? Mm -hmm. And that's a good question. That's something we, we probably need to pay attention to and be careful about not making things worse. Um, so we, we, we could yeah. be using a, a spawn, we could be spreading urchins in while culling urchins. Is that the idea? Yeah, and I, it's, it's a valid question. A lot of folks are paying attention to that. And um, I think it's gonna be part of the sort of monitoring and research component to this. And um, yeah, it's definitely a, a problem to solve. Thanks for bringing Thank it up. Thank you, that's very helpful. Tom, could you um, maybe touch on the, 
the concept of a possible north coast or you know a site like adding some work up there yeah so timing again is everything I had a great conversation with talia today <laughs> and that's what we were talking about um the intention will be to include uh, those sites that I mentioned up in, in the North Coast in the permit. Um, I kind of breezed through what we did at the Orford Head site, but in essence, what we did was agree that we would wanted to target up target that that area, but also that we wanted to get in there and first lay excuse me lay down uh, some baseline monitoring. Uh, because if we're going to go back to ODFW and ask for a rule change, because we think that this, this inter intervention will help and will work, uh, it's going to strengthen uh, our case if we come with some data. And if we go in, if we start, and I'm one of those people, like as soon as I started to see this, I immediately like, wanted to go grab a hammer and start, you know, laying down on some merchants. But I also understand the process and, and who gets to make the rules. And it's going to be important for us to be able to make a comparison to what it was like before we did that. And so if we don't do that, then you run the risk of showing up and saying what you know based on what you did and having people say, well, how do you know that? You didn't measure it before. So that's, uh, that's why one of the reasons we chose the Nelvis Cove uh, relocation was one because a lot of people were using it already but also because there had been a couple of surveys done there uh, ODFW had done some surveys of abalone there had been some historical urchin surveys there and so we had scientists who wanted to do more surveys and then the reef check folks were like yep seems like a good site let's lay down a baseline here and now we have that set up that it's going to happen again every year and that gives us our starting point so then whatever we do there from now on, we can compare back to what was like what it was like before we did it. And we're, um, I'm already, uh, Tali and I talked about this a little bit earlier about um, how we could sort of initiate that baseline work right before we go ahead with uh, any kind of interventions and set up a comparison as well. Uh, I don't know, I kind of breezed past that too, probably in my presentation, but we had the two coves side by side and we're treating one as a treatment area where we'll remove urchins and the other as a control that we'll leave alone so we can do comparisons. Um, the, other, the other wild card with these urchins is behavior. Uh, so they walk. Um, and so, you know, that's gonna be a factor as well. <clears throat> and I've been having some interesting discussions with folks about pot potentially do some tagging, maybe tracking uh, urchin movement. Um, we, I know from my urchin diving days that you know they will go move it. They'll move around. They'll move into an area, clean it out, move on to another area, uh, and that's where I think I'm really interested in a couple of the sites you guys are looking at up there, where there's uh, sort of isolated rocky outcroppings surrounded by sand because urchins don't like to walk on sand and not into it. I don't know what their thing is, but like, they don't dig walking on sand. So, so I think it. It's a good setup for um, an effective removal uh, initiative because you could pretend, I, I could imagine that you could do a removal on an isolated patch that urchins couldn't repopulate easily. So those are some thoughts. I don't know, Talia, if you want to add anything to that because you and I kind of were. Yeah, no, we're looking at the, the golden chat. I think. Yeah, I think what's important, you know, right now, uh, and it's really hard to, to because right now we're doing the, the hurry up and wait sort of scenario in a sense here. Um, I think what is important is that we need people to get involved now, but at the same time, and we, like this is not discouraging anyone, but we're just, you know, we want to make sure that we can go out there and do this in a manner that n not only positively impacts the ecosystem, but has a really, really positive benefit to the communities that are around us. You know, we're the people who understand what's going on underwater, but you know, the guy who's walking his, you know, his dog and has his wife and kids on the beach uh, could be absolutely horrified by, by the scenarios that we're creating. So 
I think it's just very important to to note that like while this is not necessarily a precarious situation, we really need to to kind of pre preach informed decision making and and have the community understand that like and our community as much as you know the community that isn't necessarily as linked to us linked to diving as possible that this is really, really important and how we behave as divers in the coming months with the survey is also going to um, going to depict the future that we have and the relationship that we have with ODF and W and these permits and how we can sustainably move on um, with restoration going forward. Yeah, that, that uh, thanks, Talia. That reminded me, Tom, maybe if, did you think it would be good to mention some of that context, kind of what Talia is referring to is some of the concerns that ODFW relayed early on about sort of having this maybe widespread public belief that, you know, urchins are all need to be destroyed and, and, and kind of the, the effect that might have on the, on the intertidal zone and, and the difference between red urchins and purple urchins, that sort of thing. Yeah, let me uh, unpack that a little bit. Um, so one thing that I would love for everyone to take home as part of the messaging, which is, I'm, I guess I'm sort of passing this along, is that, uh, so one of our partner groups is a group called PISCO. That's Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans. They've been doing intertidal ecology research for probably 20 years or more up and down the Oregon coast. And uh, there's some pretty smart scientists involved in that group that have, uh, shared with this with the Oregon Kelp Alliance that they do have a concern that we don't sort of open season on all and every urchin because they are seeing in the intertidal areas where they are working, they are not seeing this sort of what we're calling an urchin problem. Uh, there's lots of reasons for that, but the take home is that um, this permit that we're preparing to submit and requesting permission to do these pilots uh, is subtitled. So we're not including uh, an ask to do anything in terms of urchin removals in the intertidal. And actually that's one of the nuances of the messaging that we'll all need to carry with us that, um, you know, we're, we divers are doing what divers do. We're going underwater. I think Talia said the, had a brilliant, uh, I, I thought you should do a PSA, <clears throat> and that is, if you can walk up to the urchin, leave it alone. <laughs> Sorry, Talia, I stole that one from you, but oh, it's, it's a good one. <laughs> okay. You did it. You did it better than, than I than I could. Um, but yeah, I think that's an important p uh, component to this. It will be. It'll come out through the permitting process. Um, and that's a limitation that commercial urchin divers have as well. Even if you have a commercial license, you are not uh, licensed to take urchins above 10 foot depth. I'm, I'm pretty sure the number is. So that, again, is a good clarifying question. Well, I've got a couple more questions if you don't, if you, if you have a minute. Um, sure. One, one of them is from Sam is, is, is this going to be a pos is it going to be possible to do on scuba gear or is this just free diving only? I'm assuming both. Both. Yeah. Okay, and um, I had one question that disappeared on me. Um, oh, I think I just got that one. Um, is there a benefit to killing but leaving the urchins dead shells to keep the nutrients and calcium carbonate in the environment? I, I think I think it's a good question. I I would say I would say yes, but again, it's a matter of. Um, degree right yeah i certainly can share that when you're urchin picking you're constantly testing taking an urchin cracking it open taking a look at the quality of the uni and it isn't long before a friendly little china rockfish comes along and goes what do you got there and will literally eat it out of your hand and then since they've been out there <clears throat> hanging out on the reef or watching urchin divers for decades they, they know the drill. They'll literally follow you around and wait for you to do it again. So that's one thing. If it's like an urchin every so often and there's a fish right there to eat the guts and the shell goes back into the system. But what happens, you know, I think this is the question that's being asked. Well, what happens when you do that 
10,000, 20,000 times, then what? Right. So, uh, you know, that's going to be a question that's going to fold into the permitting, probably some of the research that'll follow on these projects. And the uh, good news is we've got a lot of, a lot of scientists, young and old, that are really interested in helping to answer those questions. We've got one question from uh, David, um, and it, he, it may have been, you know, you may want to re reiterate a little bit what you mentioned about er, aquaculture, but he asked, what, what, what about to work with fi the fishers to incentivize the fishery of sea urchins and try to increase the value of sea urchins on the national and international markets? Yeah, so uh, the good news for, <coughs> excuse me, the good news for urchin fishermen is, and I didn't get into these data, but I'm happy to share them with anyone who's interested, is that over the last few years, because of the reduction in kelp and the subsequent reduction in availability of highly valuable urchin, and as in fat urchins with fat gonads, um, the ones that they are harvesting, uh, particularly since the Southern California urchin market has really suffered from all this. And so, all of a sudden these Oregon urchins became super valuable. So just to put some numbers on that, when I was working, uh, you know, put myself through grad school doing this, I was getting maybe 50 cents a pound for urchins. And if it got up to a buck a pound because of a holiday or something, that was, that was a big deal. Uh, over the last couple of years, that's gone to 250 a pound, to $3 a pound, to last year, $4 a pound, uh, so when they can get them and the good qual and the quality is there, uh, those red or those are red urchins, uh, you know, getting a good price, but they're looking ahead and that's where this, um, this, uh, mariculture project to feed cultivated seaweed to adult, to, uh, ur to purple urchins, to fatten them up and get them to market. That's where that was driven was the urchin divers going, okay, what is the future here? Uh, when are we going to run out of good reds? Uh, can we start to develop a purple urchin market? So they've act, they actually started by uh, harvesting some good purple urchins and introduce them to the market, get the, get the market starting to understand like, yeah, they're different, they're smaller, but they're still good and you can market them. And uh, there's a few chefs involved in the Oregon Kelp Alliance. So we've actually already started to investigate some opportunities to bring the purple urchins into the market. And as soon as our tweaking a few challenges with our urchin ranch at, in Port Orford right now, but those will start to hit the market and hopefully it'll just grow from there. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about this uh, in our meetings with the Alliance and been told by, particularly by the ODFW shellfish biologists and managers you know, we're not gonna quote unquote, eat our way out of this problem. But uh, we do think there's value in pursuing that, uh, getting people's attention. And I don't know, I, I might get, trouble, get in trouble for saying this, but you know, if anybody could eat their way out of a problem, I would say Americans are the ones to do it. Mm. <laughs> and that was a sort of tug in cheek. Hopefully nobody gets offended by these things. Well, uh, let me look. I've got one more question. Um, Kurt, do you want to ask your question or two more questions? Yeah, sure. If I'm, you can hear me again? Yeah. Okay. They're really timing questions. So just a little, beam us in a little bit more to the timing of the, um, the permit. Um, when do you expect to hear about that? Um, and when could action potentially begin following from that? And also the, it sounded like there was a study in Nellie's Cove where you might have results. I'm curious when that would happen. And then Finally, and really the, the central question is when, what, what can we begin to do now and when could we potentially begin to be diving to call urchins or pull them out? Okay, <clears throat> uh, short answer again, I'm gonna be, I'm ambitious and unrealistic. So that's my caveat. So my intention is to have the permit submitted this month and get it approved by next month. So that I would love, I would love it if we could say in my ideal world in March, we could start doing, you know, at least uh, get those, get the baseline monitoring done and then initiate some of the removals. So that's my ideal scenario. 
and what you can do now if you're one of those people who would love to be involved in this is to uh, either contact me <clears throat> or you're, if you're in the North Coast area, if you're up in that region, uh, contact Talia or Dan because um, Talia has graciously volunteered them to help organize folks in that region. And I'm gonna take advantage of that. <laughs> now it's on the record, sorry to tell you. Um, <laughs> Kurt was definitely one of the people who I was I was uh, had on my list that I was talking to you about earlier. Yeah, today, yeah, so. yeah Kurt, Kurt, she already, read, <laughs> Kurt she, she already ratted you out, Kurt. I already have you on my list. So. Good. <laughs> Good. So yeah, that's that's the that's the first next thing is for us to sort of uh, organize ourselves, figure out who's who, uh, you know, when, and then uh, stay you know stay connected. And uh, I will certainly keep updating everybody as things unfold or don't unfold. And all of this is going to also play out in the context of internal discussions they're having at ODFW about a rule change. But we don't, we don't anticipate that happening uh, on our ideal timeline. So we think that the, uh, and actually they were, we were advised by the shellfish biologists at ODFW to, per to go forward with the scientific take permit. So they are expecting it. And I think that it should be well received. And all we have to do is, you know, devils in the details, but they're little devils. And we can deal with them. I've got uh, two more questions. And the first one is about otters and the second one's about urchins. So I'm gonna pass the second one off to you, Tom, when I get, but, um, the first one, it said, it, Chris asked, what are some of the roadblocks for otter translocation? And I'll just quickly answer that. The, the main issue is to do an, a, a thorough feasibility study to evaluate, you know, where otters could feasible, feasibly, where should they go? What are the optimal habitats that exist now? And, and the, the population sort of benchmarks we should shoot for in terms of a translocation strategy and how many individuals you know, putting, putting it through a population model, which there's some pretty advanced models Bennett, that have been developed by the leading otter, sea otter researchers, and to figure out, okay, how many otters would we need? Where would they go? Where would they come from? Um, looking at the genetics, looking at logistics, looking at the legal aspects, because the southern sea otters listed under the ESA and the northern sea otter isn't, but it's protected under the Marine Mammal Act, so there's some sort of legal parameters to consider. And then the, the final thing, which is really the most at the end of the day will probably be the most significant is the economic impact assessment that we're currently conducting a third party, you know, environmental ec economist consulting firm is, is to figure out the pro and cons from an economic standpoint of a potential reintroduction to, and especially shell, the commercial shell fishery, uh, especially Dungeness crab and, and Dungeness crab is the biggest fishery, you know, in terms of money, the biggest fishery in Oregon. And so there's some concern about the effects of sea otters to their crab harvest. So that's that's really the big one. That's the elephant in the room. And that's gonna require some thoughtful analysis. So to answer your question, that's kind of basically where, where some of the roadblocks are. Some of it's just administrative and some of it is really a serious analysis of, of whether or not this is gonna be too much cons as opposed, you know, at the end of the day, I think the trade-off is going to be even with some localized impacts to shellfish harvest, the trade-off is, is a, a, you know, a benefit to the finfish harvest rates and, and other uh, wildlife watching, you know, values and things like that. And those research, that research has been done elsewhere. So there's actually research on that question in, in other places there are otters currently. Um, so anyway, the next question I got for you, Tom, is um, uh, sounds like purple urchins are the issue. Can you give us an overview of red, purple, green? A um, little one-on-one there. Yeah, I guess uh, short answer is I think the green urchin are uh, they're typically deep water species and we don't see very many of them. So I don't, they're not really pinging the radar as a problem at this point. Uh, and one of the reasons that the purple urchin has sort of emerged as, a, as an issue is because of this sudden 
uh, what they refer to as surplus production. So they're not like, sometimes people say, well, they're invasive. Well, they're not really invasive. They're, they're indigenous to the area. Uh, it's not like they don't belong. It's just that there are multiple factors that as John was sort of outlining early on about this sort of perfect storm of factors from the warm blob to the sea star wasting to the otters already not being there. And then you just had a really good recruitment year for purple, a couple of good recruitment years for purple urchins. So it's kind of like this perfect storm and all of a sudden, bam, you've got this massive population of purple urchins. One of the things that we did notice, particularly the urchin divers and myself noticed was that we were seeing uh, purple urchins that you typically would not see in as deep water as we started to see them. So in on the red urchin grounds, which are typically in deeper water, all of a sudden you're seeing all these purple urchins. Like, just seems, you know, they're just out of place, I guess you could say. Um, as far as the relationship between reds and purples, partially because there is this uh, a good market for red urchin, so there had been this sort of built-in, if you will, kind of a matter of fact culling operation as part of the urchin fishery. So those reds were getting pulled out um, and it wasn't, you know, the system was maintaining, you know, we had healthy kelp, we had, uh, you know, viable urchin populations that were healthy, could be harvested. And um, that was a big kind of a boom and bust fishery that settled into more or less, I would call it an artisanal fishery with a handful of permits and a few active divers. Um, you could imagine they're, they're kind of like, in a way, sort of taking the place of a, a small band of otters maybe um, by just going and constantly removing those reds. Um, but now we've got this really uh, kind of off the charts uh, explosion or surplus production of purples. And as John outlined earlier around the stable state phenomenon, you know, we've had people ask, well, what if, just let nature take its course. Things will sort of resolve themselves. And maybe that's true, but we've got this overlay of temperature change in the ocean, acidification, the whole sort of context of major changes in the oceans on top of these natural fluctuations. So I don't think it's reasonable or fair to say that we actually know that it's, the balance will be restored on its own. I love the kitty cat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just waiting for that to happen. I want it. In that. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I think the take home is that We've got an, an opportunity here to tar tar target certain areas, re retain or restore kelp to some particular areas so that there are oases of kelp in the system producing uh, spores and gametophytes so that under better conditions, there can be a you know, reestablishment of healthy kelp in certain areas. Um, and some of the work that's been done is telling us that it's smarter to work towards retention of what you have than it is to try to restore an area where there is there, all the kelp has been wiped away. I've got a thanks, Tom. I've got. I'm just going to squeeze in one last question here, and um, and it is from Corin, and she asked, do do you have or anticipate the need for out of water volunteers with marine science background? My diving cert certification is lapsed, but I'd like to get involved. I'm going to say yes. I uh, would, in fact, I was talking to Talia about this earlier. I'm a big proponent of community scientists and science. And I think that we, I think everybody's a scientist and some people get papers that tell them that and some people don't, but we all have something to bring to the table in my opinion. And in this case, one of the things we've talked about is back to this earlier question about uh, if it's smart to cull urchins and potentially release viable gametes or not. And uh, so there's been some work done looking at the, uh, what we call the gonadal index of an urchin. In other words, by weight, how much gonad is in an urchin as a measure of its sort of reproductive health. 
and there are uh, scientists working on that. There's a PhD student, Sarah Hamilton, who's done some of that work already. And so there's an example of something where we could subsample a population of urchins, bring them, bring them ashore, uh, dissect out the gonads, weigh them out, and get a gonadal index on the urchins as a measurement of reproductive health. And that could help, uh, help inform us about when and when we should or should not do in-place culling. So that's just one example of an onshore activity that I think uh, you know, people could be trained to do that, that could be a supportive activity. Also, if we are going to surface urchins and try to make use of the, that as a, some sort of product, whether it be a fertilizer or soil amendment, uh, there'd be plenty of work to be done onshore, um, albeit it might be kind of smelly work, but if you don't mind that, <laughs> or you can, uh, you know, wear nose plugs or something, I don't know. Um, but I could see work there, uh, developing markets for this, this excess urchin biomass that we might be pulling up and trying to figure out what are we going to do with it. Um, so that, and just, you know, helping tell the story, uh, helping people understand what it is we're doing. Anyone who's been diving back to this initial point that uh, John was making, all of us who've been down there are great ambassadors, right? To all these land lovers that look out at the ocean and just see like it's flat. There's water and it's flat. What are you guys talking about? And then uh, those of us who've been there uh, and because we're getting all this great PR work by the wild human folks and, and the people like Laura Tesler and great photographers, you know, we'll have lots of great imagery that can be shared with people even, even in, whether in person or on social media. Um, I think there's all kinds of ways that we can all participate. And then once we get these into restaurants, you know, sell you, tell, convince your friends to give the uni a try. Um, that, that's resource that will feed back into, you know, working people's projects and uh, communities. So I just think there's lots of opportunity. And again, uh, keep a track of what we're doing on the Kelp Alliance website. And uh, if you go there, you'll see the, the social media links. Uh, they're all like at Oregon Kelp on Twitter and uh, Instagram. And we'll be seeing, you'll be seeing more of that stuff come out there. And, and I don't know, probably, probably a ton of ideas that I haven't even thought of yet. Thanks, Tom. I, uh, we'll wrap it up here in a minute. I have one a sea otter question that I will answer really quickly. Um, it, the, the question was, do sea otters feed on abalone? And, you know, that, that there may be some conflicts that have been noticed in California there. Um, one thing I will, the reason I wanted to mention this is because if sea otters do come back to the Oregon coast, one thing to think about is that in a natural state, it, you know, but when there were, say, sea otters across the Pacific, there were still urchin barrens or there were still areas that didn't have, you know, indigenous people would have hunted sea otters in a, big, in a certain stretch or a certain area and, and maybe removed a lot of them. And then there were areas where there were sea otters. There were obviously some places that had urchin barrens even then, but they, the idea being that if you just have more kelp, and, and, and Tom could maybe add to this, but if you have more kelp being cultivated by sea otters, even though they might depress shellfish like abalone immediately below them, just the, the having more kelp in the water and having more detritus for abalone and crabs and for, you know, urchins and, and, and the whole thing that the, the system at itself at a certain scale, the system supports more, more of the, the shellfish or the invertebrates that eat the, uh, seaweed or macroalgae detritus. And so I think that's one thing to think about is just because sea otters are there doesn't mean, yes, they, they have some local impacts. More of the abalone and urchins exist in cr cracks and crevices out of the way of otters. Um, but they, the net benefit of having sea otters in the system has to do with having enough kelp in that kind of waterscape to support more stuff. And so I think that's kind of the trade-off. I think of it as like a localized impacts, very localized impacts, but broadly speaking, a more resilient system, if that makes sense. Um, if that's a fair way to put it, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have much to add to that. Um, one thing I can add for sure, again, this is back to our long view, short view phenomenon. 
And one thing we know for sure is that uh, for the, all the divers who surveyed in October at our site here, uh, all of them saw abalone. One of them saw a big abalone, like a, a large honkin abalone. But unfortunately, they were all seen in, er in an area that was pretty dominated by urchin. And uh, all of the abalone that they saw were suffering from malnutrition. Right. So uh, this is one of the this is one of the selling points, frankly, to uh, to the managers in terms of our permitting, because we're hoping <clears throat> we're hoping that to be an, an immediate short term benefit to abalone to uh, remove their competition, so that whatever resources are available are more abundant for the abalone once you remove all the marauding urchins that are just surrounding them and keeping them from eating anything. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, <laughs> you guys. I, I would say at this point, if anyone is, has not wants to ask some more questions or wants to has follow up questions, I would contact Tom or Talia or or uh, Dan, and uh, we could maybe get the co more detailed conversations going. And feel free to contact me. Um, my email is john at alakalliance.org. You can find also find me on the website. Um, but anyway, thanks, thanks everyone for for attending and thank you for your questions. And I think that's all I've got. Yeah, likewise, I'll just say the same thing. Thank you so much for the chance to share all this. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too disorganized. Sometimes I feel like this, some of this ecosystem stuff causes my brain to go in like 10 directions at once. But uh, that's the point, right? It's uh, the kelp is sitting there at the core of this, this incredibly diverse and complicated system. And it's what's really driving the work we do because we see the kelp as being the central character here. And uh, you know, without it, the whole thing just falls apart. So I really appreciate the time, the attention, the interest, and anything and everything you do from here on out to help the cause. And I'm happy to help you help us help the kelp. Perfect. Thank you, John and Tom. I'm excited about your guys' projects. And I think I appreciate everybody that tuned in tonight and asked questions and whatnot. I think we're all you know, excited to see how we can help with what you guys are doing. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thanks for your support. All right. Well, we'll talk to you guys. Talk to you guys soon. Awesome. Catch and get Thanks. Some rolling. Thanks What's so much, everyone. All right. Talk to you later.